Today I have more than a story for you. I want to go to the end of the story and then we'll go back and cover the story itself. We read in Luke chapter 12 verse 31 where Jesus says to a group of people who are listening to him, Seek for his kingdom and these things shall be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves purses which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This little one sentence in verse 34 of Luke chapter 12, it's when you hear it said out loud, it's one of those things where two things go through your head. Number one, Da, that's so obvious. And number two, wow, that is so profound. It's so obvious and it's so profound. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, you will fixate and you will focus on whatever you deem as valuable. So if, if what is valuable to you is in this world, you will live for this world. If what is of value to you is in heaven, you will live towards heaven and for heaven, although you are still down here on this earth. Jesus really had to emphasize this point. I mean, this was the, this was the punchline, but what goes before this was a story that he told. And the story he tells is a reaction or an answering of a real life historical situation. When you go to the beginning of Luke chapter 12, you find Jesus with a great crowd around him. You find him telling them about great spiritual things, right? Like, for instance, here in verse 7, The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Verse 8 says, And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man shall co confess him also before the angels of God. He's speaking here about the spiritual reality of how God feels about humanity, humanity, how he reaches out towards us, how he knows every detail of our lives. We may feel forgotten, but the reality is we are not forgotten. He knows every detail that, down to the number of hairs on our heads. He then steps back and he says, hey, by the way, you know, when you choose me, when you confess me, I will confess you. You will belong to the citizenry of heaven when you choose me as your Lord and your Savior. I mean, Jesus is making a grand appeal about spiritual things, revealing the character of God, talking about high and holy things, about reshaping our very identity, about reorganizing our lives and the direction in which we live. He's revealing all these great and spiritual things. And then, in the middle of all of this, it says here in verse 13, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation. Maybe you're a teacher in a classroom, or you're a preacher in a church or something. Or maybe you're just a parent having a discussion with your children. I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me. Where, where, where you're talking about something and you think you're making this great point. Maybe something that's going to make a real difference to your children's lives or to this group of people's lives. It seems so profound. It seems like they're, 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 they're in step and in tune with you. And maybe the majority of them are. And then someone comes out of left field with a question or a comment and you think to yourself, no one's been paying attention this whole time. I thought I was getting somewhere, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm imagining that this is a little bit like what is happening with Jesus here. All these grand themes about spiritual things, and, and, and most of the people probably are hanging on every word, and then one guy in the back of the class pipes up, uh, Jesus, uh, just before you carry on with these grand spiritual truths, this grand revelation from heaven, all this kingdom of God stuff, um, I just want you to please get involved in my earthly dispute. I want you to correct my brother because he's obviously taking more than his share of the inheritance. And this is a social justice issue that I think you need to step up and deal with before you carry on telling us any more about the character and the goodness of the kingdom of God. <laughs> so Jesus responds like this in verse 14. He said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not, even, uh, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying. 
So here's what's happening, right? Grand themes of eternal interest. And then this guy hasn't taken a single word of that in because all he's been obsessing over is how he's not getting his earthly due, how his brother is taking what is rightly his. And all he really wants is to get his earthly wealth. He hasn't lost himself in the promise of an eternal kingdom. He hasn't forgotten about earthly wealth being caught up in realizing how rich God has made him in spiritual things. No, all he can think of, like a child with a one-track mind, is how he wants his dues down here. And Jesus starts with the warning, watch out for greed and covetousness. And then he goes on to tell a story. And the story, this, this story, so much more than a story, is, this, is the parable of a man who goes out and sows his field. And this particular season, this particular year, the harvest is greater than normal. And so with this an abundance of harvest, he doesn't have enough place to store it. And so as the story unfolds, Jesus says he's questioning to himself, he's wondering in his mind, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? No philanthropic service enters his heart. No idea of mission enters his mind. No, no sense of compassion to the community around him. All that, all that he can think about is, I, I, think, I think the best thing to do in this situation is tear my old barns down, build greater barns that can hold more, then I will take my ease. I'll never have to work again. This is the retirement plan we all dream about, right? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. We work for a lifetime with this hope in mind that one day we'll be able to kick back, put our feet up and say, I'm done with working for the man. Now I can enjoy my pension. I can chill out. I can relax. I can sit back and take my ease. And so that's what this man does. This is a windfall that's come his way. He's going to build a bigger bar barn. He's going to increase his ability to store. And then he's going to simply be able to take his ease and chill out. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the story goes that God taps him on the shoulder and says, Hey, tonight your life is required of you. So who is all the stuff that you've accumulated going to belong to? Where is it going to go? And the man loses his life. He has now lost all his wealth because he can't take it with him. You've heard that expression, right? You can't take it with you. Well, he can't take it with him. He's lost it all and he's lost his life. And he hasn't invested in the heavenly kingdom. He hasn't lived with a kingdom mind, with a kingdom, of, kingdom heart towards those around him. And now he has suffered earthly loss and eternal spiritual loss. Jesus tells the story to a man who's arguing with his brother over the percentage of inheritance he should, in, should have. Now, I know that it might seem to us that this is a just cause. It might seem to us that, that you know, maybe his brother is defrauding him. Well, the first thing I'm going to say to you is, well, even if he was defrauding his brother, his brother was still getting something and his brother was still missing the point that he was made wealthy in spiritual things. How many of us destroy our family relationships between siblings and cousins and whoever else when, when someone of seniority in our family dies and we begin to squabble over coins, over earthly wealth, over trinkets, over sentimental things of, of value to us, right? How many of us will sacrifice relationships to get our due, to make sure that somebody else isn't advantaged over us, to get what we, and we, we, we justify it to ourselves because we're fighting for what's fair, right? We just want what is just. And, but in the end, we sacrifice people, we sacrifice relationships, even if we do get what we want out of the whole argument and out of the whole legal battle that ensues. Jesus is saying, I want you to have a bigger view. I want you to take a, a, a higher conception of what I'm giving to you so that those things will disappear and pale in significance when you realize what is being offered to you by the kingdom of God. But Let's, let's go back to this. Was this brother really defrauding his brother? Deuteronomy 20, 21 verse 17 makes it clear that according to the Old Testament law, the elder brother was to inherit a double portion. Then every sibling after him was to share equally in what was left. So for whatever reason, God had set this up in Israel. This was the standard. This was the law, which suggests that perhaps it's the younger brother quibbling against the older brother. And in fact, the older brother by Jewish law and by biblical teaching wasn't actually even defrauding him but that this younger brother was covetous and wanted what actually wasn't even his for the taking. 
How is it with your soul? How is it with your heart today, spiritually speaking? Is it fixated on this world? Is it fixated on the gain offered by this earthly kingdom? Or have we transferred our gaze and our heart's longing to where the lasting treasure is in heaven? Are we now living for the treasure that is of eternal value, that is of uh, in eternal endurance? The treasure begins when you receive Jesus Christ, the gift of heaven, all of the wealth of heaven poured out in the gift of Jesus. When you receive him, you receive everything along with him, including eternal life. Are we so obsessed, so distracted, so caught up in the things of this world, the running here, the running there, the gaining of wealth, this scheme, that scheme, this busyness, that busyness, that in the end, we have neglected the greatest treasure of all, the spiritual treasure of Jesus Christ, the eternal life he offers, and the glory of a heavenly kingdom. So, I want to highlight something here, that Jesus tells a story that that seems kind of different when you really start to think about it. Let me ask you the question here. Who was this man who decided to build bigger barns and store his wealth? Well, I'm not asking you what his name is. I'm asking you, who is this man in society around us today? I want to suggest something radical to you. That this is a story Jesus deliberately tells about your good neighbor. Or maybe you are the good neighbor. What do I mean by that? I mean, this guy isn't the drug addict. This guy isn't the gambling addict. This guy isn't the sex addict. This guy isn't the pedophile. This guy isn't the alcoholic. This guy isn't the, the, the embezzler. This guy isn't the Ponzi scheme operator. This guy isn't the guy that does bad things, right? This is the story of the good guy, the good citizen. This is the story about a man who is probably a great neighbor, who pays his taxes, not only on time, but also his full share of taxes. This is the guy that you might look over the fence and say, man, if only I could be him. He's living the dream. This is the guy you might actually use around the dinner table when your kids are being lazy at their schoolwork to say or to try and inspire that they would be like him. This is that guy. When I had the privilege once in the United States of America of knocking on doors and doing a little ministry from door to door, uh, filling out a survey, one of the questions in the survey was, in your opinion, what does it take to be saved? A predominantly Christian society, the neighborhood we were working in, going around asking, what do you think it is to be saved in Christian language? You know what the predominant answer we got was? I don't know, probably just be a good person. Be a good person. If you're a good person, I'm sure God will save you. You know what? The kingdom of God doesn't belong to good people. And that's what this parable is highlighting. The kingdom of God belongs to people who are sold out in their love for Jesus Christ, no matter where they come from. Now, we've spent a lot of time uh, in the past, talking about stories that give us assurance when we are the bad person in the story, so-called. You know, when we live a life that's full of sinful commission, when we, live in a, when we live a life that we know is out of harmony with God's law, we know it's out of harmony with even the laws of our land, we live a life which, which most people would look, like, look at and say, yep, that's a broken, horrible life. It causes pain and suffering to other people, etc. You know, for those people, we often talk about the grace of God. We talk about the, you know, how it doesn't matter how far you've gone, how far you've fallen. The grace of God and the love of God is absolutely embracing you if you will simply choose to receive it. And hallelujah for that. But this is not that story. This is the story about the good guy. This is the story that you would think to yourself, if anybody's going to be in heaven, it's going to be that neighbor. I'm telling you, he pays his taxes, he pays his dues. Yes, he is wealthy, but man, he's, he, he's a kind kind of a neighbor. We have civil discussion over the fence. There's no rip-roaring parties. There's no foul language. There's no... I mean, this guy is the picture of a model citizen. 
He's the guy you want your children to aspire to be. And yet in the story, he's the guy that doesn't inherit the eternal kingdom. You know why? You know why? Because in all his earthly goodness, he does not measure up to the heavenly character standard of unselfish, disinterested, give yourself away in service to others standard. The kind of standard we see exemplified in Jesus Christ, who left the riches of heaven to be the riches on earth, the gift of heaven poured out for our benefit. Jesus leaves the adoring angels. He leaves the throne. He leaves his high estate. He leaves his place of privilege. He leaves all of that to come down here to seek, to save, to serve, to be bloodied and beaten and misunderstood and mistreated, all while he is seeking to bless humanity. That is the standard the good guy in this story falls short of. So, he has this abundance of crop. He fails to recognize the gift of God in that. He thinks it's his. He thinks it's his to do with as he pleases. I mean, after all, did he not farm the land? Did he not get up early in the morning? He wasn't that, he wasn't that benefit bludgeoning person down the road. I mean, he worked hard, right? This was his due. He earned it. And now he was going to live on the benefit of what he earned, right? That's this, that's this guy. Well, the reality is that God looks at his heart and he realizes that this guy, he loves the gift and not the giver of the gift. There's no acknowledgement of God in his attitude to his possessions. He does not praise the Lord. He does not return to the Lord. He does not uh, serve humanity. Instead, he looks at his lifetime of achievement. He looks at this windfall that's come his way. He sees it as his due for his hard work. He is a man of works. He doesn't live by grace. He doesn't receive by faith. He lives by works. And the, the attitude he displays towards his possessions and the way he uses his possessions for his own selfish purpose demonstrates that he is a man of works and not of grace by faith. He's not living towards God. He's living as one who has earned and now will live uh, on the basis of the receipt of, of return upon that work. This guy, this guy is living the selfish life. In some ways, the kind of life that we all want to live, what we strive for, that's the whole goal of retirement, isn't it, in a sense? You see, this guy, he's not a sinner in that he's actively committing sins of selfishness in the sense of, you know, stealing from his employer, embezzling public funds, uh, um, taking advantage of religious uh, donations or, you know, sitting in a position as a religious leader where he can take the tithes and the offerings that others return faithfully. He's not, he's not a sinner in that sense, in the sense of the sins of commission. But he is a sinner in the sense of the sins of omission. We can not only do things that are wrong, but we can neglect to do things that are good. And in the eyes of God, he sees both. And the person who is a good person by earthly standard because they're not committing acts that hurt others and defraud others, might in the eyes of God still be just as selfish and as grasping, although more passive in appearance. They commit the sins of omission in that the blessings God bestows upon them are not seen as blessings of God to be shared. Instead, they are seen as blessings to be hoarded. So whether you are the person trying to get through selfish gain what is not yours by stealing and thieving and embezzling and, and committing fraud, or whether you are the person who has received incredible trust from God but is not passing that blessing on as God intends, either way, these are the acts of commission or omission, which are the acts of a sinful, selfish heart. And that selfishness is the diametric opposite of the character of the king of the kingdom. It's the diametric opposite 
of what we see in Jesus Christ who gave it all away that he might be the gift to us that brings all of heaven to us. So one of the things that stands out in the story to me is this man, this man is me in some ways. Perhaps he's you in some ways. We often look at those who are committing acts of selfishness as being selfish. But simply by doing nothing, when we could be doing something, we are manifesting the same spirit of selfishness. The same interest in our own protection, in our own future, in our own comfort here and now. This is the idolatry of heart that I like to refer to as the love of ease. The love of ease, the, the goal to simply live a carefree life where I'm not responsible for anyone or anything, where I don't have to be out there working for someone or serving someone else. The, 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 love, the love of ease, I just want to live the easy, comfortable life. This is not the spirit of heaven, friend. This is not the spirit of Jesus Christ. If we have much it is because it had been entrusted to us as a spiritual gift to be used for the blessing of humanity, to serve God, to grow His kingdom, and to, to show the kindness of the heart of God through you. You know, they say, they say, and I don't have the exact numbers, but they say, I've heard it said, that a handful of the richest people on earth have all the wealth that is needed by earthly standards to fix the ills of this earthly world. You know, there's a trend amongst millionaires and billionaires today to say, I'm going to give it away. I'm going to give, give it away. Why? Because they've realized that in having much, we do not secure our happiness. <laughs> in having much is not the source of our contentment. Because even the richest among us by dollar standards can also be the most unhappy, the most fretful, the most worried, the most desirous of gaining more. Because if your security is in your wealth, you have missed the point entirely. Now I just need to make it clear that being wealthy by earthly standards is not the problem. It's the love of that wealth. It's finding security in that wealth. It's the hoarding of that wealth that betrays a self-sufficient and an idolatrous and a selfish heart. And no idolater, whether you bow, bow down in a religious sense to carvings of wood and stone, or whether you have the invisible idols of the heart, like our worshipping of wealth and of selfish gain and of personal ease and personal comfort over the willingness to serve, to lay down my life, to be, to be lost in giving to others the way God has given to us. Such will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is the stark warning of this parable. For those amongst us who are the good neighbor and the good citizen. For those amongst us who might pride ourselves because we do not commit actively acts of wrong against others. Steal and cheat and, and, and live lives of addiction and the like. We are the good neighbor, the taxpaying citizen, the ones that look down on those who, who we have to fund with the taxes we pay to the government, etc. The, the rebuke of this passage is to those of us who fit into that category. We're the good neighbor, right? Or somebody next door to you is the good neighbor, right? This parable is saying, hey, we need to, be, we need to do more than simply have our lives absent of activities and acts that defraud others. We need to be lost in a life of service, of unselfishness. That is the call of God. That is the standard of heaven, friend. That is what the Ten Commandments are all about. To lose ourselves in service to others. That's what Jesus is about. That's what we see at the cross. That's what you and I are called to. And that is what it looks like to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And you know, it's often in the way we use, misuse, hoard or bestow our physical possessions, our attitude towards material things that we find this selfishness betrayed. 
It's like that story that Bill Butterfield tells of his five-year-old son turning six. And at the, as they're building towards the, the six-year-old birthday party, Bill spe speaks to his son and says to him, you're going to be six soon. We're going to be throwing a party for you. What would you like for your birthday? And you know, most children, they want a certain cake, they want a certain theme, they want certain gifts, whatever it might be. He tells the story of how his son looks at him and says to him, you know, Dad, I think a ball would be enough. Well, son, what kind of a ball would you like? Well, Dad, I'm not 100% sure, but maybe a football or possibly a soccer ball. I'm not quite sure which one to go for. His father's a bit intrigued by this, and so he says to his son, well, son, I'm, I'm not really sure which one I might get for you. Which one would be your preference? If you had to choose one of those two, it seems like they're pretty close, but if you had to choose one of those two balls, which would you choose, the, the, the football or the soccer ball? And then he wasn't expecting what his son said next. His son said to him, well, Dad, I'm not sure. And really, I'm not sure because I'm not sure what your plans are for the rest of this year, Dad. Because if you're not going to have too busy a year and you've got time to spend with me, I'd like a football because you and I can be throwing that football from day to day out in our backyard. But you know, Dad, if you're going to have a year where you're particularly busy and you don't have a lot of time for me, then maybe a soccer ball would be best because at least with a soccer ball, I can go out in the street and my mates and I, we can play soccer together. Bill says he was stunned by the insight of his five going on six year old boy. Because in that answer, his son revealed something fundamental. That life isn't about the gifts that are, that are gotten or that are bestowed upon us. Instead, life is about our relational loyalties. Life is about the people we love. And by extension, life is about the God we choose to give our loyalty to. In that little six-year-old, you know, we often have that saying, out of the mouth of babes, right? Out of that six-year-old's mouth came this profound truth that we as adults often lose sight of. Life is not about our stuff. It's not about the accumulation of wealth. Instead, our wealth is actually and only a means of blessing. First, God blesses us with it that we may be taken care of, and then he asks us to bless others that they may be taken care of. Like this man in the parable learned, you can't take it with you. So use it and translate it into the currency of heaven. You ask me, Adrian, what is the currency of heaven? The currency of heaven is souls. The currency of heaven is people. Employ your wealth to bless, to take care of, to ease the suffering of this world. Employ your wealth to seek and to save the lost. Employ your wealth in such a way that humanity's greatest ills are solved. And I don't mean that humanity's greatest ills are hunger and poverty and the like. Humanity's greatest ills are, are hearts that are caught up in selfishness are hearts that are devoted to ourselves. And it's because of hearts like that, that statesmen use their position in governments to steal from the masses. It's because of these selfish hearts that people masquerade as religious leaders, but they take the money for themselves and buy jets and big houses. It's because of these selfish hearts that the poor live on the streets and that hunger prevails. It's because of selfish hearts that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You see, the, the only lasting way you can solve that problem, it's not only handing out your wealth to solve, solve social justice issues. It's using your wealth to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to introduce people to the king of the kingdom, because it is only him who can solve that most fundamental problem of the human heart, selfishness and sin, which is then resulting in all these symptoms we see in our world. So I ask you today, how could you serve those around you? How could you serve the king of the eternal kingdom? What could you do today? How could you employ your wealth to grow the kingdom of God, to lead someone, to give someone, 
the opportunity to know this Jesus who can change their heart as he's working upon your heart to change your heart as he changes my heart. This is the greatest thing we could do. And this is what Jesus is saying in the midst of a people who is telling these great spiritual truths to. And then this guy in the back of the classroom again manifesting this. I haven't been listening to a thing. All I'm worried about is this world and my possessions down here. Jesus says, hey, hey, verse 32 where we started. Little flock, your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. So as he says in verse 31, Seek for this kingdom, seek for his kingdom, and these things shall be added to you. Do not be obsessed with the round of hoarding and getting and accumulating and amassing. You can't take it with you. So how can you employ it with a heart of unselfishness to grow the kingdom of God? How can you use it to give someone the opportunity to know and love Jesus? To give them the opportunity of eternal life. Because in the end, our wealth, so called, in heaven will not be measured by the pavement that heaven's streets are paved with. When you read the description in the book of Revelation, heavens, the heavenly kingdom, the streets are made of gold. Think about that. We spend our life down here trying to amass symbols, monetary value that, that symbolizes gold. We give away our health and our time and our energy to accumulate wealth. And guess what? Jesus deliberately describes the kingdom of heaven as having streets paved with the stuff that is of most value to us here on earth. Gold. What is he saying with this symbolism? He's saying that the stuff your monetary system is based on down here, the measure by which you measure your wealth, is nothing but pavement in heaven. So use the pav pavement of heaven down here to translate it into the currency of heaven. People won for the kingdom. People in love with Jesus. People whose hearts are being changed and transformed, liberated from the spirit of selfishness. To live for eternity in the spirit of unselfishness. The same spirit and the same character that Jesus has displayed in coming into this world and laying down his life for us. This is the great goal. This is the ambition. That we would lose ourselves in the life of the kingdom, the attitude of the kingdom, the spirit of the kingdom, the character of the king of the kingdom. And as we do that, it changes our relationship to the things and the possessions of earth. Instead of them becoming the end in and of themselves, they become the means to the end. The end of service to humanity, the alleviating of suffering on this world, and the investing in the kingdom of God. For the day when Jesus returns, that our brothers and our sisters will be there together with us. This is what it looks like to be a member of the kingdom of God, to be a citizen of that kingdom. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray for your grace. I pray for the miracle above all miracles. And that is the miracle that my heart, that my friend who is hearing this message right now, that their heart, would be changed from selfish to unselfish, from obsessed with me, myself, and I, to being obsessed with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to being lost not only in selfish pursuit, but instead in the pursuit of the well-being of others. Lord, this is the miracle above all miracles in this world that we most desperately need, most desperately covet, and most desperately ask for. In Jesus' name, amen.